So today I'm going to talk about the meaning of the first day of unleavened bread and uh, also the meaning of the days. But let's begin first in Leviticus 23 to see that these days are commanded days. And these are commanded days that God has set aside for us and the world as a whole, if they were to listen to him, to keep. And of course, you say unleavened bread, or you know, the, or the days of unleavened bread, and people don't have a clue what you're talking about. Yet, you know, this is an important and integral part of the plan of God. In Leviticus 23, and we'll begin just at verse 4, it says, These are the feasts of the Lord. These are not man's feasts. These are not the feasts of the Jews. These are God's feast days. They're holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. And that's where we're at now, the appointed time for the days of unleavened bread. Verse 5, On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's a Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Now, again, to me it seems pretty clear that yeah, during these days we are to eat unleavened bread. We're not to eat leavened bread. We're to eat it because of what it symbolizes. And to me, if you don't eat unleavened bread throughout the days of unleavened bread, I think you're going to miss the point of the days. So you're to eat unleavened bread and it's to call to remembrance different things that you'll see as we go throughout. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. So it's one of, and it is the first of seven holy days. You shall do no customary work on it. It's a high Sabbath, in other words. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation as well. So we'll, again, have services on the, the last day. And you shall do no customary work on it. So let's turn over to Exodus 12, verse 14, and we'll look at it. why, historically, there were the days of unleavened bread. And we'll make a few notes along the way. Exodus 12 and verse 14, and we'll, we'll read down to verse 20. So this day shall be to you a memorial. And what is a memorial? And this is you know, what I was referring to earlier, is that it's something to remind you is something that brings to memory. And the reason that it does is because we have a short memory. And, you know, Satan inserts himself as well into our lives every chance he can get. And he's going to try to distract you. He's going to try to thwart the plan of God. He's going to try to introduce his pagan days. All these types of things are going to be combating, you know, your trying to keep these days if you were not to keep them. If you kept them only once in a blue moon, then, you know, where is the, the meaning in that? Where is the bringing to remembrance? You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So this is to be to last throughout, not just for the time, but when the Israelites were leaving. And we'll see, we'll get into that a little bit more and see that it has been kept in this fashion but is to be kept, you know, for us today. Verse 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And like I said before, this is, and the reason I bring it up is because sometimes it's a controversial point saying that, oh, well, you don't have to eat them. It's just if you do eat. But when you start completely understanding what the plan is, is that you're taking leaven out, you need to replace it with something else. And so I won't get any more on that because I don't want to rob too much from, i say, my next message. But on the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And again, there's always a spiritual analogy, and we'll be touching on that throughout the message as well. But there's a physical aspect, but the more important spiritual aspect is the thing that we're to be concentrating on, but not leaving the physical aspect undone because 
the physical points to the spiritual. And in this case, you know, a person would be cut off from Israel. And this is what he was telling them, that if they don't do this, you're not going to be a part of you know, what I'm doing with the people of God at that time being Israel. And today, it's the same thing. If we don't do this, then we can expect to be cut off as well. Verse 16. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. On the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared for you. Verse 17, so you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, which was, again, the beginning of the 15th, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day, the seven days of unleavened bread. So at evening, for seven days, no leaven shall be found in your house, since whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native. So it gives further example that when we are to do this, that again, that we keep the house unleavened throughout the whole period of time. And we're not to bring in anything into it, nor are we to allow others to bring anything into your home that is leavened. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Now, skipping over to chapter, the, chapter uh, 13. In verse 7 through 10. It says, Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came up from Egypt. It shall be, it was going to be something that they were going to continue on, obviously. It shall be a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. It's part of the law of God. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. And they did. And no, no leaven was to be eaten. It was not to be found. It was not to be seen in any of the dwellings. So why is it then that they did this for seven days? Well, we know seven is a, a number of completion. But we know also that the when they were leaving, you know, they had to leave in haste when the Israelites left on the exodus out of the land of Egypt. They were ready to go. They didn't have time to let the bread rise. But, you know, that's why they left that way. Why did they continue to do it that way for seven days? Because they didn't have to. I mean, they could have started letting it rise as soon as they got going. But they didn't because this was the instruction. All right. This wasn't just because they left so quickly. It was also because they were told that they had to continue to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Unleavened bread, as we get more into you know the meaning of what it meant, and again, the Israelites were not going to understand this at the time. You know, they were coming out of out of Egypt, having come into, I mean, having gone into slavery there, and having to be completely in submission to the Egyptians, and maybe even succumbing to their ways, their customs, their worship practices, the Israelites had to be re-educated when it came to God. So they were not going to actually know these things, and there was not going to be that evident. And we can look around us even today and see, you know, well, here are the days of unleavened bread. Tell somebody who's quote-unquote educated right now, they're still not going to know. So you can't blame the Israelites not necessarily for knowing what happened. But the reason that they continue to, you know, eat unleavened bread or to you know observe it for seven days was they were supposed to be marching out of Egypt and Egypt was a type of sin so they were to be refraining from eating this leavening during those seven days until they had come completely out of sin completely out of Egypt notice in Joshua 24 and verse 14 what was actually going on in Egypt Joshua 24 and verse 14 I mean we know a lot of the stories, right, in terms of what was happening and the uh, events leading up to going out and how they were being oppressed, the Israelites. But in Joshua 24 and verse 14, 
It says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods, with the little g, which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. So that's what they were doing in Egypt. They were serving other gods. And had there not been any specific god to serve, Satan would still have been the god of this world, the one that would have them under this way, the one that would be leading them astray. And so any way you look at it, they were serving other gods, little g. They were not serving the one and true God. The beginning of unleavened bread, this march out of Egypt, was this coming out of that, coming out of what Egypt represented, coming out of sin, because Egypt was a time a type of sin, and they were to come completely out of it. Of course, that's what we're to be doing today, is to be coming out of our spiritual sin, or of our, our spiritual Egypt, which is sin, coming out of our past. So why did God, though, use leaven to signify this sin? This symbolism that it has and this parallel of sin is uh, integral to the part of this holy days. And why, though, leaven? Let's look at that just a little bit. Let's go to Romans 7, verse 15, and understand, and again, I know that this might be repetitive, but uh, the properties of leaven are such that it ingrains itself into bread, right? And just as sin can ingrain itself into us. I mean, it's literally worked into the grain. There's no separating the leaven from the bread. In much the same way, you know, we find sin in our lives before uh, our calling. Romans 7, verse 15 to 20. For what I am doing, I do not understand. This is Paul talking. For what I will to do, what I want to do, I don't do. I don't practice that. But what I hate, that I do. So the, he's trying, he's showing that how sin reigns in his life and how he, he seemingly has no control. If then I do what I will not to do, if I do, if I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. He's saying that, you know, the sin is kind of taking control of his life. He does not have the ability to conquer it in and of himself. It's intertwined into his being, as it were. For I know, verse 18, that in me, that, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I can't do it. I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. You know, the stuff that I want to do, I can't do it. But the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. Verse 20, now I will do what I will not to do. I'll do what I don't want to do. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So are we seeing, you know, the way that Paul is describing it, and it is, I get, you know, kind of a bit of a, I don't know, alliteration or tongue twister or whatever you want to call it here, where he's, he's going back and forth. I mean, I think we're getting the point, though, that sin like leaven, is ingrained into us, and it is takes hold of our life. It seems like we cannot even live our lives without leaven, literally, in the way he's talking. We may think sometimes that we can't live without leaven. You know, after we go through the days, I know we've talked about this before, but I honestly would rather go a day without food, which we do, right, than seven days without leaven. But leaven, it's pleasurable, you know, we would we do miss it. I do miss it. I'll speak for myself. You know, and, and like sin. Sin's pleasurable, right, for a season or so it seems. But there's a way that seems right to us. You know, this is the way we, we used to be. That we used to think, okay, this is okay. But that way leads to death. It's that broad path that leads to death. It's not the narrow way. Leaven also, also puffs up in 1 Corinthians 13.4. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. And it's not puffed up. That's not love. That's not love. Love is not puffed up, unlike leaven is. Leaven spreads like a cancer. 
You know, it's one little bit 11, right? And, and you ladies would know better that it doesn't take much leaven that you can just continue to knead it through the dough and then you can even take one of those lumps and you can then propagate it to another piece of bread. And that's the way leaven continues to go. It just continues to spread through our body like the proverbial bad apple in a barrel. And it's inextricable, inextricable as we're talking about and as Paul is kind of talking about and alluding to here is when you add it to the dough, you know, that yeast, it ferments and it acts with the sugars and it uh, all the other ingredients and it releases the carbon dioxide and it causes this effect and, the, and you get the you know the some flavor from it and a certain amount of aroma as well but once that's there there is no getting it out i don't even i don't think that there is any way possible that you can get it out even with you know all the modern technology that we have and that's how sin is so when when god chose leaven as a representation of sin. I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing. Maybe he even knew before he created leaven, probably did, as to what was going to happen, what its characteristics were, what its properties were, and how the plan of God was going to work out. But the point is that we start to realize why, you know, leaven is the substance that God says, let's remove from our life, is because it is this way, it is like this sin, that is in our life. And of course, that's what God wants us to focus on is removing that sin. He, we talk about it as deleavening. You know, of course, that word's not found in the Bible and uh, or any major dictionary. And I even Googled it and I said, define, there's a, a switch. You can put define in your word and it comes up and it tells you, you know, all the dictionaries tell you what this word means. Nothing came up with the word deleaven. So it could be a, a just a church word, but nonetheless, we understand what we mean by deleavening is to unleaven your house as it were so god wants us to remove the leaven from our lives he wants us to remove spiritually sin from our our lives let's look at some scathing words that christ had in matthew 7 and verse 5 matthew 7 and verse 5 As we start defining um, what more specifically leaven is, it says, Matthew 7, verse 5 says, Hypocrite, and listen, we'll keep an eye on that word, hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So they had not taken care of the glaring problem in their own lives first, just as we are to. First, make sure that we are right before God. We are to remove sin from our life first and foremost. He was a, this person was a hypocrite because they had this huge issue and they didn't see it or they refused to look at it or they refused to deal with it. And they were more uh, you know, concerned with trying to get somebody else right before God. Let me define hypocrisy uh, for you. Hypocrisy is a pretense of having a virtuous character, moral, or religious beliefs or principles, etc., that one does not really possess. So it's a pretense of having a virtuous character, moral, or religious belief or principles that one does not really possess. So if we were to go to someone who knew of, say, our major sin in our life that we were doing, how do you think we would be received? You know, it's not going to go over very well, is it? They're going to say, you talking to me? Are you serious? So if we're going to someone, say, they don't know of a major sin, God does. He knows of our ongoing sin. What does he think whenever we go to somebody in that vein and not in the right manner with a bigger sin, you know, that we should be taken care of? Well, he'd think that we are hypocritical. That's exactly what Christ was saying. And this was a huge problem for the Pharisees that was very evident to Jesus. Let's turn to Matthew 16. 
Matthew 16, now we'll begin in verse 1, read to 12. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 12. It says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, Christ, asked, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered to them, saying, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites here. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no, no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. Now when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So Christ is calling this, what they do, leaven. The leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they reason among themselves saying, Is it because we have taken no bread? You're thinking, okay, wait, hold on a second. Is it, you know, who, who, who forgot to bring the bread? Why is, he, why is you know, Jesus getting on to us about this? Why is he saying that? But Jesus, obviously knowing and discerning, being aware of it, said to them, O oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? You know, afterwards, there was still stuff left over. They went there with nothing. The making of bread into multiple loaves, that's not a big thing. We can do that. That's not the issue here. You should be thinking that I'm talking about something else. And do you not yet, I'm sorry, in verse 10, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000, he goes on, how many large baskets you took up again. How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So it was their hypocrisy, their pretense of having a virtuous character, moral, or religious beliefs that Christ was equating to leaven. So he's looking at what they are doing, the way that they're acting. Of course, we know this in an improper manner, that that is what he's equating to leaven. Let's have a look at what the, they were doing in Mark 7 and verse 3 to further define this for us today, for the spiritual reasons. So we know now that the, the Pharisees and Sadducees are called hypocrites, and that their hypocrisy is, is their leaven. The leaven is their hypocrisy because of their doctrines. Verse 3 of Mark 7, it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way. So it's one of their own little rituals holding the tradition of the elders. Not the traditions of God, but the traditions of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. They had all these rules and regulations and rituals concerning this. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And this is what they're worried about. He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, not the commandments of God. They're worshiping with their lips. They're in word only. But their heart wasn't in the right place. Verse 8, for laying aside the commandment of God. This is the leaven of the Pharisees. It is sin. It's this hypocrisy of trying to be and pretend to be religious, but not really being that way. And Christ is calling them out on it. You lay aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well you reject 
the commandment of God, that you may keep your tradition. So they were sinning. They were discarding the law of God. They were replacing it with their idea of what was right. They were not concentrating on the big things, like the plank in their own eye, or the more important things of God. They got away from the trunk of the tree, as we call it, and they were overly concerned about the things, not even necessarily on the branches, but way out on the very edge of the limbs, on the little twigs. That's where they were. Matthew 23, verse 1. Matthew 23, verse 1. So we're painting a picture of what Christ is calling leaven. And it's this hypocrisy of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They're moving away from God and developing their own ways, their own religions, them saying what's important, not what God is saying important. And whenever you move away from God and his law, that is sin. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. They didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. They make in life difficult and tough, much more so than it had to be for the people that they were over and authority of. And Christ was saying that in respect, they sat in Moses' seat. But they themselves will not move them with one of their own fingers. Sound familiar? But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge their borders of their garments. So they have these ostentatious displays of this outward piety. And again, this is what he's getting at. They love the best places at the feast, the best seats at the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. It was all about this show on the outside, not the inward parts. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. So do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Now that's the opposite of what was happening and what was going on there. You know, these guys were wanted the great seats. They wanted the notoriety when they went around town. They wanted to be the, the big way. And he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. In verse 13, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Again, there's the word, which means that they have a form of religiosity, not the real thing. In other words, they were sinning, and then Christ goes on to show how they did it. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, remember that was part of the definition of hypocrisy? For a pretense, make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, yet again, calling them hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And he goes on with all the other things that they were doing. And then verse 23, once again, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, speaking of the tithing, without leaving the others undone, the justice, the mercy, and the faith. Blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Continuing with this long list of sins that the, of the scribes and Pharisees, and by no means a complete list either. And then finally, verse 26, blind Pharisee, 
first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish that the outside of them may be clean also. Again, not talking about the dish in the last verse. The Pharisees and scribes were concentrating on the less weightier matters of the law. Their cleansing rituals, while they were taking proper care of the brethren, and they were misrepresenting the kingdom of God. Christ is saying here in verse 26 that the scribes and Pharisees should be cleansing their insides so that the deeds that they do do on the outside would be done in the right and the correct manner. Matthew 6 and verse 16. Again, we're talk, continuing talking about the, the hypocritical Pharisees. I'll probably say this word more today than I've said ever in my life. It says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. They want everybody to know that they're being pious, right? Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. That is it. When people say, oh, look, they're fasting. Good job. Verse 17, but when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face so that you do not appear to men. Again, that was the problem, right? With the scribes and the Pharisees and the person in verse 16. They want to appear to men. They want to seem a certain way to men. To be fasting, but to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So what we're seeing here is that these they were being this way on the outside. They were trying to appear to be that way. And they were not cleansing the inside. They were not concerned with the things that God's concerned, such as the heart. They had a form of religiosity, right? 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. It talks about this way in the end time, that this is one of the many of the attitudes, and it's one of the lists that we talk about of the way that people will be in the end time. And of course, God's telling us not to be like this, to not be hypocritical, and to not be sinning, to remove the leaven from our lives. Second Timothy 3, 1, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. Again, this starting to sound a lot like the Pharisees that we've been talking about. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such people turn away. We cannot be that way. We cannot have a form of it. We have to have it. We have to have it thereby then giving the right credit to God. That's where it comes from, not from the traditions of men. And it says turn away from such people. And God turns away from the same people as well. So if we're going to be in this same boat, this have the sin, the leaven of hypocrisy, you know, God will turn away from us. So they were trying to appear religious, but it's not about the outward. It's about the inward because God looks upon the heart and that's what we are to be having right before God. Let's look at what Paul has to say about this in 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5 verses 6 through 8. First Corinthians 5 and verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? So the way that these people were acting, this, this glorying that they were doing, a little bit too self-ingratiating, was like this little bit of leaven. Though it might have seemed harmless and might have been it might have been a one-time thing, it might have been an ongoing thing, might have, you know, they thought maybe not too highly of it. But nonetheless, it's like this leaven, this sin that begets other sins and that grows. Therefore, purge out the old leaven. He 
the word for purge there means to cleanse thoroughly. That's what God wants you to do. This is what Paul is having us do here. This is what he wants them in the Corinthian church to do, is to purge out the leaven, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. So once you go through this process of, of repentance and becoming baptized and turning to God and having the hands laid upon you and getting the Holy Spirit and walking forward in faith, we are to be unleavened. We are to be removing the leaven from our lives. We are to not be leavened. We are to purge it out. So he goes on that you may be a new lump since you're truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us so that this could happen. And he truly was unleavened. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Now, that's interesting. As a side note, here we have Paul, and he's saying us, let us, this New Testament church in Corinth, as well as all the others, that they're keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread here. So, again, what we're seeing, too, that, okay, well, if you have any doubt as to what it meant to keep this throughout your generations as a memorial, then we see, obviously, here, after Christ had done it, you know, Christ kept it as a as a boy. In fact, that was when he... Uh, got left behind in Jerusalem and, you know, parents didn't know where he was. That was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then he kept it as a man. And here we have now Paul, which is subsequent to the death of Christ. So, you know, here we are sometime later. Paul is keeping the Feast of Unleavened Bread with the Corinth Church. So this is a day that is to be kept continually. And again, th this should really be a no-brainer when you look at all the other holidays, right? You look at the other holidays, they're pagan. They come from other origins. This is what God is asking us to keep or telling us, in other words, or commanding us. Not that uh, most are doing it. But yet, here it is, you know, in black and white, as it were, that we are to continue to do this. Now we're just talking about what you are to do on these days. He says, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, like that of the Pharisees, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth which kind of reminds me of what joshua was saying that we read earlier that we're to serve god with sincerity and truth so we're to be removing sin from our house more importantly how do we purge out the leaven from our life we're to do both one looks towards the other when we take it out of the house that's you know a symbol of us taking it out of our lives. Well, the first thing we need to do is we ask God for help, and he will. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 11. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us say, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And again, he did that in a sinless fashion. Despising the shame, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Again, we're talking about okay, getting God's help here. You've not resisted to bloodshed and striving against sin. We're putting it in perspective. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he, discour he scourges every son whom he receives. So we're looking now that, okay, when we do have sin in our lives, you know, one of the ways that God goes about showing us, if we're not able to you know, see it ourselves with his help, is through chastening. Again, he is going to, like we do, our children, him being the, the perfect father, is going to help us to see the sin in our lives. And he's going to chasten us. He's going to scourge us. If he 
loves us, he will do that. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? What we're just, what we're just saying. But if you are without chastening, all of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So God is going to, if you are one of his sons, he is going to chasten you. He is going to help you to see how you can become a better son. He's not going to no, neglect his job as a parent. Furthermore, we, had, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? You know, do, should we not appreciate the things that God is doing in our lives? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as, as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. This is the end to which, you know, the correction is coming. This is why he is going to help us root sin out of our lives to deleaven us, as it were. It's for our profit in the long run. You know, when we look at what it took, what our parents did, that was a short period of time compared to what awaits us in terms of eternal life if we keep the path. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So what we're seeing is that, okay, God can help us with that. He can help to you know, get the leaven out of our lives so that we become uh, you know, more righteous, that we have the fruit that it brings. Of course, we have our part. We can be doing our part. The more that we do do our part, the less that he has to intervene or the, the less in the severity that God has to intervene. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. An integral part of these days and the time that leads up to the days of unleavened bread. And again, it's something that we're supposed to be doing throughout the year and not just only at this time, but say to a greater extent at this time. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 says, Examine yourself. This is what we're to be doing as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? So when we examine ourselves and test ourselves to see if we're in the faith, we're to look and see if Jesus Christ is in you. So we're looking to see if Christ is in us by the power of the Holy Spirit and leaven is not in us or sin. The two do not you know, go together. They're not compatible. You know, Christ who was sinless and the sin that was part of our carnal lives. We're to be re rooting one out and putting the other in. And we need to be diligent about this. Look in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 28 to 32. First Corinthians 11 and verse 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Again, it's talking about this time of the year, that you're to examine yourself, that you don't do that, as verse 29 says, in an unworthy manner. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So we have the opportunity to go, you know, put your life under a microscope especially at this time of the year, and to judge yourself. And if you don't do that, then God will do that for you. So you have this opportunity. And I'll just read Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10, because I think most of you know them. But it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. So God is going to look 
into the heart. He's going to look inwardly. He's not going to look outwardly. Now, the things that we're doing outwardly should be a reflection of what we do inwardly, unlike what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing, right? So now, you know, that is the place that we need to be focusing on. Now, God's given us several tools to do this. And again, we can use these tools throughout the whole year, and specifically this time of the year, to, you know, deleaven our lives. You know, when we go through the, the house, and you're doing the depth, the deleavening. You know, we're using the vacuum, the wet rag, you know, flashlights if you want, different attachments. You got this crevice one. I mean, you know, I, I get the big one out, and it just doesn't fit into the points. You got you're going, oh, I can't leave that there because you're looking at it. You know, it's it's honey bun or something sitting down there, and say so it's just you know glaring back. You got to get that crevice one and, and get in there. And sometimes it doesn't come up with the first pass. You got to do several passes, but you can't give up. You just go, oh, you know, there's some leaven. So I guess I'm just going to leave it there because it didn't come up in the first pass. No, you got to go through and you, you have to recheck and you maybe have to take a different approach and a different angle. Well, that's what we can do with, with prayer, fasting, Bible study, and meditation. And they're the big four, as we call it, and they're complementary and they work together. Prayer, we do that every day. We do that several times a day if necessary. And you can and should do it and be in a, a spirit and an attitude of prayer continually. Without praying, we can't have our prayers answered. God hears and he answers, but you have to ask. And now the answer is not always yes, right? It's sometimes no, but that's because that's best for us. Bible study. You know, through this we learn and we know God. We learn the word of God, the way that we are supposed to be acting, what is right and what is wrong. Unless we're studying and trying to study intently and actively and trying to just learn something new, get a better, deeper understanding. You know, unless you're studying, you're not going to get to that point. You're not going to learn what you need to learn. And if you don't do it, then God will do it. So we can come to this deeper understanding by studying and reading and rereading. Fasting is another tool, tool that we have at our disposal for drawing closer to God. Through it, we can have a better understanding of the will of God. Meditation, one of the most underused and over, often overlooked tools of the big four, but it's one that God has given to us. And in particular, at this time of the year, you know, I find it um, you know, good to, while I'm doing the deleavening, to, to meditate and go, okay, why am I doing this? What is the meaning of this? What is the purpose? What are the lessons that I can learn? And while we're to do the physical, that's not the most important. It's to learn the spiritual lessons as we go through and uh, deleaven and as we go through these years, uh, this, these week, this week, these days. And, you know, by using all four of those, we can have uh, you know, a good chance, a better chance of us looking at our own lives, deleavening our own lives, and, you know, not having to have God come in and do it in God's way, in God's term. And God's, you know, while he's a merciful and just father, you can think of how, you know, it went with David. And, uh, you know, whenever, you know, well, David several times, many times, whenever God came and said, okay, well, you did this, so now, you know, here's going to be the uh, the chastening, the correction. Sin is counterproductive to living a Christian life. It's going away from God and our ultimate goal. Romans 7, verse 23 through 25. You know, this is what Paul said after many years of conversion. Romans 7, verse 23. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. And that's where the battles take place for us. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh of the law of sin. Here he is, you know, Paul continued to fight this. 
is always you know, warring, as he says, in our members. These are the things that we have to combat on a daily basis. This is what we are to be getting out of our lives. We are to be looking for these things to remove them, to overcome them, to subdue them, to make them of no effect. And we do that, obviously, through the power of God. One last set of scriptures in Psalm, Psalm 51, verses 7 through 10. We'll go back to David. And kind of what we were just talking about. But David, after you know, committing the sins of Bathsheba and Uriah, and after being confronted by Nathan, he said this. This is how David approached removing the sin from his life. And it's very similar to a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about. But Psalm 51 verse 7 says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. So here's the first thing he says. Yeah, well, the first thing in verse 7 is what he's saying. You know, cleanse me thoroughly. Help me to remove this sin from our lives, like Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 5. You know, purge out the sin. Purge out the leaven, and I shall be clean. And he's talking to God here, because he knows that God's the one that has the answers. God's the one that can give him the power to change and to make these things happen. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Wash them away. Cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart. And again, this is what we're talking about. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were not clean on the inside. O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Brother, with these things, we can make a good start to the days of unleavened bread. But this is not all there is. There's another side to it. And we'll address that on the last day.